name is Steve Barron. Guten Tag. Uh, ich spreche nicht or nein Deutsch, so as you can hear. So this is um, in English. And Ninja Turtles was uh, uh, a great movie f for me to to work on and and to make and great fun to do. And um, it uh, it it took a little while to develop. Um, to get the script right and pitch the, uh, the the tone of it in the in the right way and and work out a world that uh, where these strange creatures could uh, coexist uh, with humans, but uh, you know I think uh, eventually in the writing we certainly got that right and hopefully on the screen we found a, a happy medium and this this opening was really uh, was really actually shot after the event with um, with. Uh, what it's been stolen and the setup of the the kids, um, because we didn't make that in the full production schedule. It was just uh, there was a number of things we didn't quite do because we only had seven weeks to shoot it, and uh, we made it for a, a relatively low budget. Really, it was uh, seven million dollars at the time, and uh, so you know, just just the uh, the turtles alone, you know, were going to take up most of that budget. So it was pretty tight, and so. You don't get a great deal of expanse in it, but uh, yeah, this was kind of, in the end, this opening scene right up to um, uh, to, to the uh, the TV being stolen and things was uh, was shot after the event to cover up um, a bigger opening that we had in terms of uh, uh, some shells coming out of the sewers and uh, more going on um, in the sewers world intercut with a little more um, epic, I should say, uh, stealing across New York, and it ended up being quite small and quite tight because we just didn't have the cash to uh, to uh, put it off that way. Um, this was shot on a Roosevelt Island. Uh, Shredder's Den was the exterior was just across from New York. It was part of our four-day excursion into New York, and. Uh, chance for us to to use the real New York as a character in the city but most of it was shot in North Carolina like these interiors of the kids working out everything they've stolen and, and pulling them together for the shredder were, were all shot down in North Carolina um, in Wilmington um, along with most of most of the interiors and a fair amount of the exterior streets around the turtles area um, Again, and that's a, the R, WTRL is a is a, uh, is a place in uh, Wilmington uh, that we converted to look like the TV studio. John Fenner was the DP. Really, uh, he did, I thought he did a great job, and uh, I'd worked with him on the Storyteller. In fact, a lot of the team came from John John Hurt's The Storyteller, which Jim Henson, executive produced a TV series um, about early European folk tales. And that's where the idea that actually Anthony Minghella got to recommend me to Golden Harvest to, to do the film because I'd worked with animatronics and uh, creatures uh, doing the storyteller and it just seemed a natural progression to uh, do something as as bizarre, I suppose, as, uh, as th this idea when it first came out was you know extremely bizarre. A lot of people, a lot of the studios wouldn't touch it. It was such a strange concept. Um, but... Yeah, now it all seems, uh, and especially you know, fantasies, really come come to the forefront of of movies, and uh, it, it seems like you know just uh, just a fairly normal, um, but hopefully enjoyable experience now as a movie. Um, things like the fight there, where the, uh, the 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 thugs were all tied up, uh, that happening in the blackness was was partly a whole schedule thing. When we put the schedule together, we just couldn't shoot it in seven weeks. And so I just tried to make things that would take quite a long time like that, uh, you know, how exactly they overpowered the uh, the guys. Uh, tried to make it all happen in off camera or in the darkness because that would certainly save on time. And uh, and I also felt it yeah, it just adds to it. I mean, it's nice in, in movies when you, you it's some things are left to your imagination. And as the opening titles come in, you see uh, the um, what was built in the in the studios in Wilmington, uh, in Dino De Laurentiis Studios in Wilmington, and uh, it was 
you know, pretty much a really, really great set uh, that uh, the design team built. Roy Forge Smith was the production designer, and uh, we wanted to get the look of that those sewers as uh, as as good as possible. And so he added things like tide marks, and uh, you know, get, gave it a real get a real texture and quite an extensive build. It was uh, probably our most comprehensive set, even though we had April's apartment later on and everything. It was a it was a pretty um, pretty big build with because it wasn't straight walls it was curves and uh, so the timber had to work with the plastering and that sort of thing the turtles themselves are another whole story um, you know these are guys walking along in suits that are carrying 60 pound packs of animatronics um, electronics and servos in those shells and uh, that was really inventing technology from, from the beginning in terms of what um, Jim Henson's Creature Shop had to do. It was a big challenge because obviously we wanted the the uh, them to be free and and alive, and uh, that was that was pretty tough. Um, the tur the the turtle's master Splinter, the rat, was in some ways more conventional uh, a puppet because there wasn't somebody inside him. There was uh, Kevin Clash, who was the the uh, the operator. Uh, he operated Splinter from underneath, um, with an arm, up into his bo into his neck and head. And then, as with all these characters, there was uh, there were puppeteers, further puppeteers who were dealing with blinks, and eyebrows, and what they call smile, which is on the edge of uh, the mouth. Um, and the actual jaw itself was was generally inside the. Uh, it is inside Splinter, but uh, is is external for the uh, for the turtles. Um, we cast young actors that uh, played the roles of all the turtles and uh, tried to go for for actors or a cross between performers and actors. Really, um, uh, in in Leonardo, that was somebody who has actually done costume work before, um, whereas uh, Raphael. Was Josh Pace, who'd, who'd really uh, only done, had never worn a big mask or, or gone inside a costume, and it was a new experience to him. So um, we did extensive castings to find the right the bodies, and then uh, and movement and performance in that way, and then uh, extensive uh, work to find the right puppeteers to match those and do the uh, and, and get those people in sync. So offset there, there would be a whole lineup of puppeteers who were driving the, uh, the the blinks and mouths and the eyes and everything of the creatures, and they did a lot of rehearsals, obviously with the costume uh, guys, the guys inside the costumes, to get into totally into sync. And the weird thing was on set, you would for their performance, the guys inside the costume would sing or say whatever it was they were doing and the puppeteers would be performing it so that they could get their jaw movement right and the and the mouth and everything. So you'd get two, at least two voices of the same character out of sync at the same time on set. So on set it was, and in rushes, when you watched it in dailies, it was like a mess. <laughs> Audio-wise, it was uh, something that was hard. You had to just uh, suspend your belief if you, as you have to anyway but uh, and, and just uh, just go with your instinct in terms of how it would all come together in the end again we had a tank in the studio so we could uh, we could get water into those sewers and keep them wet and uh, and r really go for that obviously not where we had the skateboarding pieces The actual performers are really looking from under the eyes. Um, they're looking from a tiny little slit under the bandana, which I shouldn't really tell you because you can you can actually see it pretty clearly. And and I know that uh, from seeing people talk about the film on the net, there's a number of times where we just were you know weren't able to hide it, and you can uh, get a sense of it and. If you look really carefully, you would you would see the face of the performer somewhere in that mouth, but uh, hopefully not too often. 
Um, in those days, digital effects were very expensive, and so you couldn't really clean things up the way you can nowadays. This is the same actor uh, who plays Michelangelo. So he's delivering a pizza to himself here. This is the exterior we shot one day, one night, with with this character, uh, and he's he's called. Uh, I think his name was Michelin. I'm sorry, I don't have that on me, but um, and. Uh, he is delivering the pizza to himself, who's in, he's inside the suit as Michelangelo in the sewers as well. So he's, uh, he's it's the same, vo you know, same voice as well. So um, what we tried to do was they were going to spend weeks and weeks and weeks inside the costume, so give them some little moment in the film where we could see their faces when I tried to do that with all the, uh, the guys in the costumes, and I think I'll be able to point most of them out as we go. Again, as, as we were filming, it got, uh, it got simpler to work with the turtles. It got easier and, uh, and more fluid. Um, critters, they're, they're coming out of the movie theater and, uh, and Critters was on there. There was a film a few years earlier called Critters and we just felt that was a, a, a smarty one towards not many films that just had creatures in. This um, this was filmed in New York. I felt again it was very important to uh, to have New York in as much as possible, and uh, we couldn't. There was nothing in Carolina. I felt the edge of the park we needed before we got into the park, and then once we were in the park, we could get away with you know this being uh, um, you know North Carolina. The thing that really gave it away was there was thousands of crickets down there in the south, and, and audio-wise you'd know it. So we had to clean that up. Um, and this is actually Sam Rockwell. Did a, this was his first little scene in a movie. Um, he's one of these two punks. Uh, and uh, so, you know, he went on to become a big star. He's really good, good performance in this. Really enjoyed working with him. I had no idea. Obviously, he was going to become such a big star, but you could see a real talent there. And Elias Cortez, who's playing Casey Jones here, he... Uh, he just felt perfect when he walked in. Uh, there was a, quite a lot of heat on him as an actor, and uh, he hadn't done a big film yet. And uh, he just uh, he just leapt off, uh, you know, out of out of the room straight into that, that comic book uh, character of Casey Jones. And we'd we'd lifted this really off of uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird's uh, comic book. Uh, so they had they had really the, the first series of comics were fantastic and, and gave us tons of ammunition for the film and really uh, this was a scene right out of one of the comic books it was uh, even the, the sports equipment um, I did actually uh, we ended up adding the cricket I think one of the writers we worked with Bobby Herbeck uh, came over to work with me in London as we were um, preparing the whole thing and uh, he saw that I, I think I took him to a cricket game and so he gave Casey Jones a cricket bat and out comes the cricket bat there, which is not in the comic book and, and not in North American culture really as a game. But uh, he stuck it in there and it's kind of quite a nice little quirk for the movie. This again is Raphael. Uh, Josh Pace was in that suit, and as I said, he didn't really have that experience of working inside and, and uh, inside costumes and things, and he found that difficult. And that's him right there in the back of the taxi. That's Josh Pace, who plays Raphael, and that was his moment on screen. He's inside the suit as well that came across the bonnet, and he's inside there. Obviously, we shot them at different times. Um, and uh, he's a really good young actor. He's done lots of films since. The, he had a, a bit of he had quite a few problems. It was interesting because he, he plays a, a character here who's, uh, who's, who's got a dark side and who isn't comfortable in his own skin, green skin. Uh, Raphael is the most troubled of the turtles and um, he seemed really perfect for it, but he also had, uh, you know, he actually also had trouble with, uh, 
with living with inside that costume and occasionally he'd, he'd get claustrophobia because the servos were right in front of their faces and the noise and the uh, intense enclosed feeling there would uh, would get them uh, would, would get him quite claustrophobic and he would we'd have to rip his rip the head off quickly and get him out of there which and it wasn't quick to rip off because it was all tied together and things so uh, you know he he went through it which kind of fits the character but you know it's uh, he did a great performance on it the camera in this scene is actually it's called a snorkel lens it's a, a camera that shoots down onto a mirror that enables you to get really close to objects um, that you couldn't normally get close to because you'd have the camera would just be too cumbersome and the lens would be too cumbersome and I told Henson's that I wanted to do this scene where we got really, really close to the animatronics, to the creatures, and I said it would be in a dark environment, but that it would really examine them. And they were pretty frightened of it, but I think the animatronics really held up. This is Judith Hogue, who uh, did a great job of April O'Neil. I just thought she had the character. She came in for the casting. There was uh, there was a real uh, energy to her that I, I felt belonged to April O'Neil. Tatsächlich so wundervoll, dass ich ihn jeden Morgen dahin fahren muss, nur um sicher zu gehen, dass er auch wirklich hingeht. Sehen Sie? Das macht er immer, wenn er mich ignoriert. And Danny, I seem to remember that uh, that T-shirt is a Sid Vicious T-shirt, and pretty sure that idea came from the comic book as well. I'm pretty sure there was a moment when Ke when Kevin and Peter had drawn that character with that uh, T-shirt and we, we thought we, we took it all the way in that. We tried to remain pretty true to the comics to the point of, you know, actually putting some of the scenes on onto film, which was really unusual at the time. People would generally reinvent the whole thing and throw away the original material, but um, uh, I felt it was you know, strong enough to really go for it. The studios uh, in North Carolina um, was was actually right under a, a, a flight path that uh, to the local military airport. And um, so sometimes we would be shooting a scene where um, the turtles' faces would you know, radio controlled by the puppeteers who were a few yards away. And the radio signals from a, a plane landing would send the face of the turtles into completely involuntary and inappropriate spasms. It was, uh, it was very funny. Uh, obviously, you know, if the light was fading or the producers were saying, we get, we got to move on, it wasn't that funny. But it was, um, it was something that uh, we, you know, we, di we didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't, and no idea would would affect us, but uh, you know, who would know until you actually do it? A little bit of rubber suit on Raphael there. You you get those moments where it's become very, those hands become a bit rubbery, and the shell dents in and shows off its rubber form. Um, but uh, you know, as I say, I think that, that Henson's did such a great job of. Uh, you know, without them, this film would have been uh, really, you know, nothing. <laughs> because it was all about the turtles and selling that and, and imbuing them with character and um, and a, a feel of tangibility and, and reality. And uh, that was really important. Yeah, this is part of the movie where turtles are wanting to make contact with April, and uh, oh, I can see a little bit of the eye hole under the bandana again. But uh, it's funny looking back at it after all this time. It's uh, it, it's some good memories. This was a, a subway scene, and we were allowed in our again in our four days in New York. We you know had a choice of. What, what I could shoot, and I felt to try and build a subway station would be a nightmare. There was obviously nothing in Wilmington, and this was one that was available for use from uh, the New York City film department. 
uh, one that was only used for a few hours a day. So we could use it, I think, through the night we used, ended up using this. And uh, pretty expensive. Most of our budget went into turtles and shooting in New York. But it just kept very much the flavour we wanted. That little charge together. I used it a few times in the movie. Uh, I was quite fond of shooting at uh, different film, different camera speeds. And uh, in that moment, we probably shot at two frames a second and kept everyone fairly still as the, he charged towards the foot members. And and then also, even when he's fighting, um, any of them are fighting, I'd just swap around because you're normally at 24 frames per second in film. And uh, sometimes we drop to 23 or 22 because, like this walk of Raphael through the sewers, it, it can be, with the weight on his back and everything, it, it can be uh, a little too slow. So he just trimmed it up a little, run at 23 frames a second, made it a tiny bit faster. And then when the kicks happened in the faces and things, we'd go to 22 frames occasionally to just get the... Uh, the speed of the, you know, get their muscles really pushing them through, propelling them through the air. Yeah, we're back in the turtle's den, and they brought Raphael back to the den, and this is one of the few times you see Splinter's feet, which was a different rig to his upper body. His upper body had to have Kevin Clash underneath with his hand in, into his head. And in fact, the whole set here for the puppeteers is actually built up four feet above the studio floor, so you could uh, have puppeteers under the floor at all times, for, with, in particular for Splinter, but uh, also for the, for the turtles. It was a good way of getting cables, any cables we had to attach to them um, on, under the floor and out that way, and there would be puppeteers down there looking at TV monitors and uh, able to see what was going on through the camera, um, but not what physically is happening live on set. Again, this is very much taken from the comic book, this scene, when very, very much how April O'Neil first reacted in uh, comic book number one, probably, I think it was, uh, to, to the turtles and, and their world. It was absolutely boiling inside those suits for those, those turtles. It was, um, I think all the performers lost at least 20 pounds each during the production. They were, they all got so skinny and it was uh, it was quite an art piece uh, off the set where you'd get uh, them resting. We would we would take you know if we had a, a, to set up one sh from one shot to another, we'd get their uh, their heads off them so that they could uh, breathe and they would sit on these horses that were made of wood and rest in a certain way that wasn't too heavy on their backs. These flashbacks to the early stories of the turtles growing up and the ewes and the uh, and the whole uh, backstory uh, were shot on Super 8 uh, uh, which is you know obviously very grainy I just wanted to get that retro look and uh, a lot of it was done Brian Henson Jim Henson's son was a second unit director so these were very tricky time consuming shots with those real Turtles running out of the can, and uh, um, and the uh, and the puppeteering of the of the young Splinter, and the young turtles growing up there. That was all very time consuming, and so we put that onto second unit. And he did it all on a Super 8 camera, which uh, the producers were slightly freaked out about because there was no cover for that. You know, you you were shooting on Super 8, sending it to the chemist almost to get it developed, and uh, it wasn't very professional looking but I think it, it worked for the look of the uh, the flashbacks I think what what really worked uh, in terms of the puppeteers and their performance and being able to to put across uh, these characters 
uh, what was the humanity and that what is what made them work with uh, the, the the characters, the human characters in the film, and because uh, that was always going to be difficult. I mean, you know, when you're planning it or reading it, uh, you know, a, a, a normal woman walking along with four Ninja Turtles in the, uh, and the way they looked was always going to be a, a tough sell, but you can't you buy it because of their humanity, and that's a big credit to Jim Henson and the, the creatures that they created and the way they managed and puppeteered them. The manhole covers that uh, were built on the streets there really they had to be built. We couldn't use a real street here because these turtles were too big to get through a normal manhole, a regular one even in New York. They're, they're just too small. They couldn't have got fitted through. So we were always going to have to build them. And then we we dug under the, the set. This was a New York set that was in the back lot that we revamped uh, from other movies that were made there at the De Laurentiis studio. And then we dug down and found water, actually. They went 15 feet below ground, but uh, it was more, they kept flooding. So we had to pump them out as well as uh, have enough space for uh, turtles to be down there and come out from them. Then we're back inside the studio. We built this whole apartment for April because, well, as you see later, it gets, uh, it gets trashed. So that was the way to do it. And again, also any real location shooting with the puppeteering is very difficult because you've got a big team of people all around. Um, and we had to build a set up again four, four feet off the ground to get underneath and run these creatures. Because where they can, we've got them actually wired in. There's a wire coming going up to their bottom <laughs> and getting up under the shell. And that is, is a more accurate way of ro running the servos that control their mouth movement. And those servos, no one had used anything as fast as that in animatronics uh, before this. They servos had been used, but they had to move so quickly for speech. So that was um, that was a first. A lot of things were a first here, and to get it done. I think here's another moment where the camera under cranks which means reduces speed and gets goes down to, I think it was six frames per second here, really to get across the anxiety of Raphael. This was the camera dropping in speed as it came round and round and round. That was new technology at the time now, very common now. But uh, that was uh, new technology that you could do that reduce the speed with also changing the aperture and that sort of thing. Again, important for this scene, the character of these four turtles now being a little bit different without their their master. They've always grown up and been dependent on Splinter, and now he's he's gone, and they have to uh, they have to deal with that. And performance-wise, that was a, a transition for them all, which I thought they really pulled off. New York shots that just kept the flavour of New York in there. Just in trying to uh, to sell the film initially, uh, to be to be made to you know as a, as a producer as well, I was part producing it, and uh, I went down to uh, Cannes the uh, the year before we filmed it and uh, tried to pitch it to everyone. And actually, funnily enough, we got a German sale. Uh, they were kind of, they got it, and uh, so did the French. Um, and that kicked us off, at least gave us some of the money in pre-sales to, uh, to get going on the builds with the, with the, with the uh, Henson creatures and things. And then we, um, we took it to America thinking we'd get a US deal. And uh, um, everywhere we took it, every studio said, uh, no, that sounds ridiculous. Teenage Mutant, what? They were... They were they would they wouldn't even read it some of them it just uh, couldn't couldn't get past the title page because it was uh sounded like what they called a trauma film which was a studio that did very strange giant 
tomatoes and uh, odd things from outer space. And uh, we couldn't convince them that it was a uh, that it was something that was much more that could become much more commercial. And at the time, the cartoon had just appeared on the, on the TV at six in the morning on a Sunday morning, and little kids were watching it. If the studio execs were four year old kids, we'd have got the deal straight away. But uh, they weren't, and they weren't st they weren't watching them watch it, so they didn't, couldn't tell that there was a, an audience gonna, that was going to work for it. And uh, it was really hairy, it was touch and go. We got to North Carolina uh, to begin production and, uh, you know, we just didn't have a US deal and that meant we really didn't have the money, even the seven million dollars, we just didn't have it. And uh, at the very last minute, New Line Cinema stepped in and said, you know, if that's worth a punt, we'll, we'll, we'll buy it for America for two million dollars. Um, while we were making the film, the cartoon just grew and grew in popularity, and uh, we, uh, we we got uh, further and further with uh, with thinking that, uh, that that we might be you know have something that that could do really well, and uh, but we had no idea of the popularity when the movie came out. It was unreal in in terms. Of, I was in LA at the time, and. People were, in the weeks leading up to it, were reacting to the trailer and uh, leaping out of their seats and clapping. And it it felt like, you know, we just hit a moment and a moment in, of time and a, and a very different film for people who were looking for a different film and um, kids who, who just loved these characters. And uh, that's, uh, that's Sam Rockwell there, just at the front there. We, you, obviously... Uh, we know him now from uh, from Moon and and one other what, Green Mile wonderful films movies he's done, um, and uh, the film just uh, just went from strength to strength and and opening weekend it made twenty five million dollars at the box office uh, which was doesn't sound a lot but was an enormous compared with the size of the movie and it was an independent movie and New Line were an independent company at the time and. Uh, it uh, went on to make 135 million at the U.S. box office, which is, for a long time, was uh, the most any independent film had ever made until uh, Blair Witch came along. And um, so, it, you know, looking back, it you can see it, but at the time, it was very hard to to sell it to to uh, to people as a as as an idea that uh, that could be a, a great franchise and things. We used a lot of the ninja fighting. Uh, we used a team from Hong Kong, Golden Harvest, who uh, produced the film, who initially bought the rights from Eastman and Laird. Uh, they, they're a Hong Kong-based company who'd done a fair amount of films, including some Bruce Lee productions and uh, Jackie Chan. And uh, they, you know, they sort of handed it over to us creatively in terms of producing it, but. Um, they gave us some great leads on uh, people that uh, that would be good for the ninja fighting, and they came over from Hong Kong. Um, uh, a, a really great stunt coordinator who's credited on the film, and uh, worked with our U.S. stunt man, and uh, did a, a pretty fantastic job. Actually, they were uh, as it was a whole different attitude to the to the U.S. stunt people. Um, in terms of w what they would do and how they would do it, and uh, their, their fitness and their level of fighting was in, was just incredible. They were, and, you know, at no time would anything be too difficult for them, and uh, they would uh, they would really lay their body on the line for the film. In fact, a couple of them actually got injured. They didn't speak any any English. So we had a translator and. Uh, they, each one of them did what, you know, each one of the turtles so that uh, we carried that, that, that sequence. And then they would also supervise all these sequences, the demonstrations that Shredder is now about to do on his, uh, his ninja prowess. We tried to stay very true to the ninja, the, the culture of ninja and uh, its, its meaning of channeling energy from within and the you know silence really in Japanese culture that was uh, an ninja warrior it was, it was invisible was uh, 
was so in tune with the universe that uh, he could uh, he could move without being seen or heard. Lots of kids there from uh, um, the local Carolina um, schools and things. We've got, we got quite a few extras and brought them down to a, a factory just outside of Wilmington, uh, which again is supposed to be just across the river in New York. Um, and it just worked on the right levels. I can't remember what the factory was for, but it was uh, it was definitely abandoned. And, but it, uh, it kept a lot of its uh, features that we could use without building a, a big set, because we didn't have the budget to do that. Um, with, the, with Splinter, we uh, you see the amount of water in his eyes there. I would constantly ask the puppeteers and the creature shop to, to add more, add more. I was always pushing that, because I felt the more you had in those eyes, the more we believed it. And it was a little bit of a fight because he's made of latex, and uh, you uh, you kind of destroy the latex. Even if you put, you know, a water-based glycerin on those eyes, it just slowly eats away at the latex. And uh, so, but I, I feel it was, you know, really worth it, and they did as well. Just 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 to uh, to really to really make that character live. I can't stress how much uh, you know. I owe my involvement in this film to uh, Antti Mingella, who, the late great Antti Mingella, who won the Oscar for English Patient and did many other movies. Because he was uh, he was approached by Golden Harvest about doing another project, and they showed him this comic book of Ninja Turtles, and uh, they said this is a very strange thing. They had no idea how to do it, but did they know anyone who might? And uh, he, he pointed it, you know, my way. He immediately saw that you need somebody with that sort of thinking to uh, to, to make it, and uh, and he, he put me onto them. And obviously, I was really grateful because at the time I'd, I'd done one movie, Electric Dreams, and uh, that uh, was really, you know, I, I was being asked to do mu mainly music because of my background in music videos, mainly music films, and. Um, and not very interesting things as well. And something I was always looking for something that was different, and you couldn't have got more different than this. It just made it. That say that just f that just flew through to uh, Donatello's legs. Um, that's the sort of shot that you you know you need to. Uh, we we did it uh, in camera and uh, ran a little invisible wire. With the sigh kind of coming down the uh, the, the barrel of, of that, that wire, so it would uh, it would stay in the right direction, not endanger anyone. This is where Raphael and Josh Pace, who's inside the suit, really really pulls off uh, what he's what he needs to pull off here, which is the breakup of this group of brothers. Without their their master splinter, they're uh, they're lost, and in particular him. And uh, it puts pressure on their leader Leonardo and uh, um, and Raphael, who's already um, a little schizophrenic and uh, capable of going off the off the rails. It puts him out of whack. And in this case, where he's cartwheeling and jumping along that roof. This was a rooftops in New York, which, uh, you know, again, we wanted to keep the New York feel. Um, and he, uh, that's our Hong Kong based uh, stuntman in a much lighter suit with a much lighter backpack with no animatronics in it because they don't need the facial movement. So that face couldn't move, it couldn't smile, it couldn't talk, it couldn't blink. But it didn't need to, it would just pull off everything else. And now we go to the. the Back to the suits that really uh, can do everything, and inside his backpack is 60 pounds of animatronics. So there was always each shot was a different method, or a different suit, or a different performer, even inside to, to put across what needed to be put across. With the writer Todd Lang, and uh, we were always looking for moments of irony to, to get some comedy into it and obviously the 
turtles all watching the tortoise and the hare is, uh, is a bit extreme, but uh, felt it worked and just bought the rights to a, a car, the, car, the classic cartoon that we thought would work with that. Um, they're kids, they're teenagers, and I think that was what it all... We had to keep remembering. They've got all those muscles all over them that kind of goes away from that feel, but uh, they are teenagers. Back on the roof, the fight is really, uh, as it intercuts with these scenes, it's really something that uh, we did in the studio. We had another big set and a big build, and, and that was the hardest one to match, I think. That exterior roof with the exterior shots of New York from earlier were, uh, you know, were a different vibe. There was slightly, uh, obviously, studio to, to real exterior. It's, it's a tough match, especially when you're you're not cutting inside, you know, you, you, you're staying on the same location. Um, we used a big uh, backdrop that uh, was a photograph, a massive camera photograph of, uh, of New York that just helped it. And then quite a few stunts, what we would try and do is we would, uh, we would shoot what we can on main unit because of our seven-week schedule, and we'd have you know, the main actors come into a situation like these guys all coming into the, uh, the store and, uh, and, and take it as far as we could. And then as fight, as these turns in, into fights and uh, these scenes uh, became more about uh, stunts and things, we would, um, we would hand it over to second unit. So these moments here, probably falling on the ground and the being kicked and everything, we would have to go over to second unit, who'd, who'd carry on with the uh, the sets once we'd weed on the main unit, began the destroying of them. We'd be there with the main unit shooting the first entrance there of Raphael coming down, smashing through the skylight, and the first foot, members of the foot coming through, and then you know, what we could, if there was any dialogue, we'd shoot it on main unit, but uh, there would be a lot of second unit work left over in terms of kicking and fighting uh, and things. I think this was quite a big uh, moment in the uh, trailer, got got lots of laughs, was, uh, was the nunchuck scene, um, which became a problem in uh, certain countries of the world. I'm not sure about Germany, but I know in the UK, the nunchucks were uh, were a problem. They felt that it was too violent for kids. They also they felt that the word ninja was uh, was a little too violent as well. So teenage mutant ninja turtles in the UK became teenage mutant hero turtles, which I felt was a bit silly. But I didn't have much say in the matter. Um, you know, I, I felt that it was all about, you know, with the, with these fights and things and, and obviously young kids seeing this, I, I felt it was uh, it was much more the swashbuckling uh, three musketeers, you know, they run around in those stories and have, you know, have always for, for children through the decades and centuries have, have heard tales of knights and and uh, sword play, and, and I felt it was an extension of that, and it wasn't mean spirited, and it, and it had, um, you know, a real atmosphere of, uh, you know, that was that was light and fun, and that you know compensated. It didn't. It's not like what I look at some of the computer games of today and think, well, has that um, in any way moved? people to to violent or kids to violence and I think sometimes it does and I don't think I, I can put my hand on my heart and think you know, I didn't feel it was that way with this film and the spirit of it I don't think it attracted everyone to go out and uh, be bad <laughs> Again, we're really destroying the set uh, bit by bit. Uh, so we'd, as I say, come onto it for a day or two and then give it a second unit and come back onto it. And uh, that was obviously a one taker with the floor collapse. Um, that would have killed us if that didn't work first time. Um, so we, you had to 
hope that those things did. And those stunt guys coming down through that roof, that is, uh, you know, that, that's that's a pretty heavy stunt to do because that's a good 12-foot drop and there might be, you know, um, good good soft cushioning on the, on the floor, but it's, uh, it's still a big drop to do and, and, and not easy and can be... Can be dangerous, and the, the guys from Hong Kong were amazing at all this stuff. And a great spirit. You'd come to work, and they're, they're uh, you know, everybody was smiling. We had a very happy crew, and uh, you know, in between setups or whatever, you know, they they do little pieces. Where one of the turtles would just break into some bizarre little ditty of a song, and. Uh, um, you know, it'd be good fun. It would always be, uh, it would be good fun. We we were making a little, weird little indie film that uh, that we had no idea what it what it would become, but uh, it was uh, it was good fun to do it. And this is Elias Cortez coming back as Casey Jones, uh, coming back into the story, and it's sort of pointing towards Raphael's, you know, missing and uh, and needed and. The, they've always worked as a team of four and now here comes Casey Jones to fill in the fourth member of the team and really uh, take the place of Raphael through that little moment in the story and uh, and, and get uh, get the team back working. fire made it all the more difficult really just the heat that was coming off of those uh, those are burners that are done by gas and you, you can kind of turn them up and then quickly turn them off after a take but the heat that it generates uh, and these guys are already pretty hot in these suits and things so it was uh, it was pretty tough for them and you had to shoot quick and and one or two takes wherever we could it was just really grab that take and know that in the editing we could uh, get around any awkwardness uh, and, uh, and and move on. And the editing, really Sally Menke was the editor and it was one of her first movies and uh, she did an amazing job and um, she went on to edit for Tarantino through all his movies. Actually, I don't think he's done a movie without her and uh, she's, so she's never available now, if ever. Uh, but this was just about her first film and I thought she did a a great job uh, of cutting it together and uh, and often it was not easy because you know we just had to get out and, with what we had and that wide shot of the burning building for instance talk about getting out with what we had we you know we we're getting into post-production there and the budget was there were no one was going to give us any more towards the budget uh, so um, my intention with that show was always that uh, in the background would be the rest of New York at night and uh, that was a digital effects shot which in those days would have cost about $25,000 which was so much to us that uh, we couldn't get it and um, I did actually take the film along uh, kind of quietly and I got in a bit of trouble for it but I took the film quietly to uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg at Disney at the time because I'd cut it together after six or seven weeks and I, I just felt it was all these little bits that we didn't get time to shoot and, and those extra pieces that I would have loved to have had another week shooting to really upgrade the movie that little extra and uh, um, he he liked the film and uh, he asked me to you know to to get involved in it and uh, but uh, in the end it was uh, it, it wasn't possible, and we never got to do our extra few days shooting, and I never got my digital effects where <laughs> they were. But you know what? Maybe they weren't necessary because you know now you look at it, and uh, it's it is what it is, and uh, you know you just accept it for what it is, and uh, and I think sometimes the restrictions are a benefit because you just don't go into everything. You see films have so much in them now. It's so so much like a big box of chocolates full of uh, richness that uh, that can overboil it. And this was sort of bare trimmings, but where it, where you're there, you 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 know the time is spent on character. This this rat 
you know, is, a, is an incredible character. And I think it is a character that will live, especially for kids at that time or the adults who grew up and were kids at this time will remember that uh, they're, they're believing and, and living with these, these characters. And uh, that was a big part of the fun. Kevin Clash is an amazing puppeteer and it's his voice as well. Uh, who's grown up and worked on Sesame Street and um, and with the Henson creatures for many years, and uh, and he was just born to to be Splinter too, and he did he did such a great job with him. I think we added. I don't think it was in the original comic books, but we added the the ear being torn off of uh, Splinter from his past. For story reasons, it really kind of hooked up, as, as you can see through the film. Now, this is the house that they uh, they get, they run away to, uh, which is supposed to be, you know, within traveling distance of New York. Um, so it's a little bit of a cheat because we're obviously out in Carolina here because that's where we were and we found an abandoned house and the location people found it and we could use it and you know we made it a little we we, we roughed it up a bit more and uh, and got it into a bit more of a state but uh, it is if you live within three hours of New York you probably wouldn't find it quite like that but uh, it, it worked for what it was and it was straight out of the comic book again volume two I think it was that. Uh, of the original story, the way they uh, they have the big fight at uh, at the antique store and then run to the country and and re recuperate and try and figure out how they're going to get their uh, master back. And uh, this is where the relationship really between Ellis Cortez and Judith Hogel, April and Casey, really grows. And uh, we were got into a bit of human interaction and performance and. Uh, and I thought the two of them played off each other really well, actually. And Todd had uh, written some really good dialogue. Todd Lang and the, the writer had written some really good dialogue for them, and uh, it just it just seemed to gel. It was a nice few days of shooting out there. Um, pretty uh, pretty hot because we were you know down south there. It's uh, it, it can it can get very hot and sweaty, but. Uh, it was, it was good fun to do. And some years ago, I'd, I'd done um, a music video um, some years before this uh, for Aha, Take On Me. And uh, it was a, an animation, live action to animation drawing. And uh, I still had it in my mind. And, and so, you know, as you tend to repeat yourself, I, I, I just ended up thinking, you know, why doesn't April draw and, and why not use some little moments that kind of give a nod towards the comic book and, and have these characters see them as drawn characters as well and, uh, and, and do it that way. Really nice lighting again. I think John Fenner, uh, I've said it already, but uh, I think he he did an amazing job. He gave a, a little bit of a European sensibility to it because it comes across as an American film and uh, I suppose you don't really expect it to be directed by a British director. A lot of people were surprised by that and um, a, an English DP and uh, that uh, that really gave gave it, I feel, gave it, you know, that, that European edge, which uh, which was was not that common in, uh, in, in the movies that were more on the commercial uh, family front. It's a moment as well in the film, this reflects, you know, a moment where you know, we can be more tender with the characters and uh, and really um, work work with their relationships and uh, and and spend some time and and live with them away from the mayhem of fighting and rebuild them. Yeah, Alice Cortez is really a 
It looks like a, a young Robert De Niro we all felt at the time, and uh, he s sounds like him as well to a degree. But uh, he went on a, to a really strong career after this. Uh, he went to uh, the Terence Malick film that was nominated, and uh, you've seen him in many, many other things. And uh, always uh, he did he did number two. I didn't do Ninja, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles two and three. Um, he comes a little pratfall about to happen in, in this little moment, which uh, gets a laugh, but it's a cheap laugh, obviously. Things collapsing, but uh, yeah, two and two and three, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't work on. I mean, I felt once I'd done one, it was, uh, you know, it was just going to repeat itself to do another, and. Um, but uh, I know uh, they, they changed April, but kept Casey Jones as uh, uh, for quite some time after that. And this is a sweet scene of a reconciliation between uh, Leonardo and Raphael and... And now these guys have got to keep together. Kodak moment line was straight out of a, a, a series of TV commercials, which uh, would, would uh, run a commercial and then get into the Kodak moment. And uh, so we pulled that straight out of American TV. Um, the look of the exteriors there was just really done with a, a straw filter. Just that kind of it gave it puts it puts across that warm look, a straw coloured, I suppose, and uh, and just gives it uh, a nice cinematic edge. We storyboarded uh, a lot of the film. Actually, I've got hundreds of drawings and boards that. Uh, were uh, pretty accurate. If you look at the storyboards now, you you can see um, how it related to the actual shooting. A lot of it was, you know, we, we went by those boards. And uh, a lot of them were done by um, Brendan McCarthy, somebody I'd worked with quite a bit at that time and since. And uh, he's, a, he's from that comic book world. And I, I thought what was happening at that time really was even though there weren't that many comic books being made into movies, it felt like uh, the the influence of those comic books and those artists coming into movies and designing and storyboarding was definitely there. I, lo you know, when I discovered him, I went away from the con conventional storyboard artists and more into those comic book artists because that's what they did, really. You know, when when you saw the panels going panel to panel, they're telling a story and. Uh, so they learnt the craft of storyboarding in a different way that kind of came out of, of, of comics. And uh, I thought that was a massive uh, asset to this film. And, and later I did Coneheads and a few other films with Brendan and his sensibility was always uh, had a positive effect on the film. Of course, Kevin Eastman and, and Peter Laird were you know, tremendously involved in, in the film. They uh, they really were excited about making a film and never been around a film before. And uh, I went up to Northampton in Massachusetts where they lived and where they had created the Turtles. And uh, I spent quite a lot of time up, up there with them talking through what the film would be like and how it would work. And once they started seeing the maquettes, the actual miniature models of the, the characters, and they really got excited about uh, their uh, their dream coming alive. This is a moment with Leonardo and Splinter connecting through meditation on the astral plane almost. And we talked about doing more in that sort of astral plane world, but uh, we didn't in the end. I Trivial Pursuit, uh, I think I played it all at Christmas before that and I was like, let's do something ridiculous, like a, one of these questions for the turtles. It was just while we were developing the script and I just felt, I don't know why, but I don't know where they got Trivial Pursuit from. But it just got in there and sat there. Leo, 
uns wegen nichts hier rausgeschleppt hast, dann macht euch keine Sorgen. So this is, yeah, more of a moment. Again, there's always a gag, the marshmallows gag, but it's kind of a serious moment where these turtles are coming together and trying to, uh, to connect with Master Splinter. And, and, uh, and that, that is sort of... You know, it's a sort of fascinating part that could be explored more, I think, in the Tur Turtles franchise of, of the future is, is what goes on with that universal connection and how many levels of you can contact people on what level and and whether they are, uh, you know, whether they're like radio waves, really, where you can kind of, when you have a hunch about something, you feel something and connect with someone. One of the few actual effects we did on the film it's just really a kind of soft mix again really could have done something very special nowadays but uh, very basic here um, as a as a fairly straightforward uh, post effect When we were filming, uh, the we watch rushes and and uh, dailies as they call them in the states, and uh, we, we you know I really enjoyed the, the level of lighting and the darkness of of it, and um, felt that was right. But we did get a lot of notes from the uh, studio, in particular the Hong Kong studio, who were very frightened that uh, we were making it too dark and uh, that kids were wanted it bright and colourful and. And to uh, you know, we were constantly getting notes, and I, I caught somebody talking to the DP, talking to John Fenner, and saying, uh, you, "It's got to be lighter. It's got to be brighter. You've got to brighten it up, and everything." And uh, I seriously fought that because I, I felt that uh, you know, we'd grown up with um, Grimm's fairy tales, and uh, um, and you know, uh, certainly. Uh, more ancient fairy tales, and that kids really can take it when it's uh, when it goes into blackness, and when they have to uh, imagine it for themselves, and and where it's not all bright and shiny and colourful. And so I, I really fought that, and I, because I felt also if there's one story that you know you were trying to get across that about uh, it was that these turtles came from the sewers, and here we come back to the sewers. And that's where it's all dark and, and black, and that's how they've grown up, and they come out at night, and so I felt it belonged to the film. The rain here was uh, was a problem, obviously, with the contraptions and uh, and all the radio, radio um, control stuff, but uh, we had to be very careful because it had to be pouring and uh, big rain towers and everything, and these guys got pretty wet inside their suits, but uh, yeah, always, always careful with that. Uh, we tested a lot of this, these sort of uh, actions and, and knowing that we were going to go in the rain and things, and we were testing a lot in London before we even moved to North Carolina, and uh, uh, near the Henson studio we ran into it as an old churchyard where we, uh, we had Leonardo, an early prototype Leonardo, tumbling through the grass and that, and uh, you know, London's notorious for the rain, and uh, so we got to test it there first, and uh, and it rained on us, and uh, we still kind of uh, stood up, um, and uh, you know, the paint jobs and everything, because constantly touching up parts of the turtles as well in terms of colour and uh, and you know the latex arms and the latex faces would constantly deteriorate and, and fall apart, and um, so, you know, for every Leonardo, there would be 10 sets of arms and, uh, you know, t a few different heads, not so much with the robotic animatronics because they are, you know, they were, they were, um, they were one-offs really, but uh, the replacements of other parts of the body were, were quite plentiful. Big latex department producing all that latex for us. We brought as well about 30 crew from London, from the Hensons, uh, and uh, it was uh, it was a you know a, a big part of it that uh, 
these guys had all worked together on many other things, uh, from Labyrinth to Dark Crystal. They'd kind of grown up heading towards this, never quite this technology, but, you know, getting very close in the moulds and the latex and that sort of thing. But uh, they, they were very experienced. Um, and uh, they all came and lived in North Carolina, which was a great place to actually make this film because it was so quiet. I mean, I, I remember driving to work every day. It would take 18 minutes and, uh, it, you know, there was no rush hour in this little the town of Wilmington. And uh, if there was one, I didn't notice it and uh, stayed on the, on the beach, not far from the studio, had a little boat there. Didn't have, it makes it sound like I had lots of time to... Uh, to muck about, but um, you know we were we were pretty busy. But it was a very comfortable existence away from a big city. It kind of made for uh, you know a, a, a happier film, I think, than if we'd have shot it in a big metropolis like London or LA. It uh, you know we were a bit more hick about it and a bit more local, and uh, we we're on our own. We won't. No one. No one came there and interfered so uh, that was all pretty useful too <laughs> film obviously relied heavily on sponsorship Domino's Pizza stepped in and uh, gave us a big deal uh, which uh, was was a massive part of it and helped with the financing and uh, um, and really built up Domino's as well because they you know they didn't know they had such a big hit on their hands and they didn't know that you know they would end up increasing massively the sales of pizza. Every kid who saw this movie went home and ordered pizza immediately and or on the way home or, you know, it became a big issue and there were Turtles pizzas, there was a Donatello pizza and a, a Raphael pizza and, and uh, you know, they, they all... Uh, that stayed and, and stayed around for a number of years. And the toys, too, were, were enormous sales. Um, I know my kids were about eight and seven at the time and they uh, I bought them some Ninja Turtles plastic tricycles and they just played on those for month after month after month and uh, obviously loved all the toy figurines and everything that came out of the movie and were obviously delighted to be on the set as well because they got to uh, got to be hugged by Donatello and, and, and got to know all the characters involved in creating and performing in the film. This again is the Shredder's Den. Now, the whole idea really of the Shredder and the kids um, wasn't in the comic books. This was an idea, I felt there was another thread to the movie that had to be brought in to, uh, to, to drive the story. And uh, I'd read about a little article um, someone had sent me in a Philadelphia Examiner, I think it was, about a character who was a modern-day Fagin from Oliver Twist who had all these kids out stealing for him. But they weren't just stealing because they were frightened of him. They were stealing because, you know, what they, were, what they could steal and what they could get out of it was something that was very interesting for them. So the idea was, you know, very much that, uh, that the shredder keeps them entertained with everything that they would possibly want and uh, has them on, on the hook in that way. This again is now going back in the scene with, between Danny and Splinter, uh, going back to flashback and uh, the Super 8 footage, this tiny little camera on top of a big camera crane and a dolly it looked pretty hysterical. I haven't got any pictures, but it was, uh, it was always very funny to uh, put put a little kind of a um, home camera on, on on a big movie set the backstory is is quite involved actually and, and uh, one day I think Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird want to do a an origin tale which really focuses on that uh, that backstory, that involved backstory. I think we added the ear being cut off. I'm pretty sure that that was our invention for story reasons. But uh, most of it is pretty accurate. And there's Sid Vicious on, on the front of uh, 
Danny's T-shirt. And uh, really, there was a connection there as well because um, for a while, I was going to, uh, and I did some some meetings and, and work with uh, Malcolm McLaren, who was the manager of the Sex Pistols. And uh, uh, I think I knew him quite well at the time and uh, was very interested in an album he'd put out, which was uh, classical music, kind of given a bit of a, a kick, a modern, a modern twist and in that kind of slightly punk vibe. And uh, um, I had uh, an early cut somewhere, but I'm sure it still exists somewhere, um, where uh, it, uh, it was set to McLaren's uh, music and classical Blue Danube and, and these real classical orchestral pieces with this driving beat behind them. And uh, it was quite sophisticated. It was probably too sophisticated in a way. Although, I was, you know, looking back, it would be great to have tried that. I kind of ended up, they ended up with the music going much more, obviously, towards the commercial feel and, uh, and, and away from something as eccentric as that. But it was, that's why I kind of pushed the Danny and the Sid Vicious and the Sex Pistols thing was because I wanted... Uh, to uh, to to get McLaren involved in some way, and I think he got us the permissions and and clearances for those uh, those shirts and things. And and uh, punk was something that was very much in uh, in my past. I'd, I'd worked with a, a new quite a few of the new wave, the Jam and, and the Clash, and a few of those bands, and uh, just uh, what, you know wanted to uh, again naturally bring some of that. Into into this uh, into these kids and into uh, this re this rebellious uh, goings on. Here again, we're diving into what we have built, and I think they look pretty good actually. Uh, the 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 manhole covers and the drains and things above the ground were as hard as those, you know, creating those sets below the ground uh, because because of the uh, the earth in uh, North Carolina. And uh, I did remember going there one day and the, the opening up those manhole covers and it just water just poured out of it and it, we had to come back and shoot another day. Here again, we're back to, you know, how do we do another fight which would take us and the main unit a day or two and would take the second unit three two or three days to clean up and we you know with an overall production schedule of those seven weeks there's just no way we could fit it in so where it was blackness earlier in the film it's steam here that can cover up um, the fight itself and uh, let us imagine it and keep the schedule makeable and doable um, you know often film is a is a is a compromise of of uh, you know of money versus art I suppose and uh, you know you fight for it to look as good as possible but you have to be re be responsible and and make it fit what the what the, what the uh, the mechanisms of the finance uh, demand it to fit. Another little fight sequence here. How we really, we wrote in the script uh, the, the sort of story of these fights, but didn't really go into the detail of the actual um, happenings. And then there were, um, in the week leading into production, there were discussions on each of the fights. And, uh, um, you know, I'd storyboarded some of it uh, and had some ideas in there, but then... When we got together with the Hong Kong Hong, Hong Kong stuntmen, we uh, we really worked out what what would be possible and, and added the angles of uh, what they felt would would sell the the hits and and the fights and things. So uh, by the time we got on the set, we knew what we were doing and we re-storyboarded to uh, to fit that. I think Kevin and Peter had. had had done really well in in creating obviously all, all these uh, characters. We didn't really add new characters to the uh, to the movie, but uh, Casey Jones, I think, is my 
my favourite, maybe because he's a sports freak, but it, he just is... Uh, it's just a character that, uh, that, that really lit, uh, holds the film together, I think, um, as, a, as a, somebody you want to. You know, there's always... When you see a film that you enjoy, I think there's a character that you just can't wait for him to come back in on screen and stuff. And uh, With these action sequences of skateboarding, we had... Uh, I can't rem remember his name, but uh, I'm sure it's on the credits. The skateboarding expert who uh, did those pieces was amazing. He could just... I mean, he'd come in and, and do all these incredible things when we put the suit on him it'd obviously get a bit harder but he'd still pull it off and just going back to characters you always wanted to come back on the screen sam rockwell who's there that's a the young sam rockwell with the probably his first beard actually um, but uh um he became a character that uh, in that in the way that elias cortez is doing this film as someone that you uh, you you enjoyed being with him and you kept kept him away for a few scenes and then you really wanted to come back to him. Makes such a difference when you can get these young cool actors and he came out of New York and uh, the casting lady who, Lynn Kressel, her name was, um, who cast uh, later did, did uh, I worked on Merlin and Arabian Nights and a bunch of other big hallmark shows uh, did a did a great job and uh, just found found that talent that uh, before it before it had broken and uh, and she was you know so good at that and getting people on the set that you could really trust to pull off a performance. Is more trailer type dialogue. I seem to remember these uh, these sort of quips being in the trailer. That was a, you know the fun of it, fight and quip, and then you know another joke and, and then a bit more fighting, and that's that's how they grew up. And I mean, it's pretty incredible what uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird did with them, these four turtles, because you know they they definitely uh, were so thought out as characters and and. In, in fact, in the original comic books, they were all wore the same colour bandana, a red bandana. And uh, so you couldn't really, on first sight, you couldn't you say, well, that's four turtles, they could all be the same person. But they then worked extra specially hard to, you know, obviously give them all these different characteristics that, uh, that you know, things they would do and say that then uh, distinguish them and uh, and and in going through that process they were so well drawn by the time we got to our film and uh, it was all it was felt that they needed to have you know more a different identity than that and the colors uh playmates toys who were going to release the toys just said that it couldn't sell for different turtles if they've all got the same look and things so you know that became an issue and uh yeah, and it, so we ended up with the different color bandanas but the different characters had already been drawn by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird very much so and this is our, our moment of first viewing of the shredder by the uh, by the turtles and there's a shot uh, we used a, a, a camera operator called Mike Brewster who very really good at staging and tracking and movement and things and he does a lovely tracking shot right into the shredder as the shredder turns into the camera that uh, I always remember being really uh, impressed by and uh, how he uh, he staged it and uh, and and you know made it happen that's coming up Again, the gags with <laughs> we call that car cock in uh, in England, that uh, paper, scissors, stone. I'm back out on the streets. We're back in the uh, we're back on this set in uh, North Carolina um, at the De Laurentiis Studios. It was used for a movie 
uh, a big big man in little China I think it was called um, and it was uh, it was built for that and it was uh, it was it was a fairly big street for a build and um, it deteriorated quite a bit but we we were able to revamp it otherwise there's the shop for Mike Brewster with the term for the shredder but um, the uh, you know that we would have been really seriously in trouble I don't know quite how we would have made the film without that street and that the, the, it was it was big enough to to really give us our so much of the movie we've seen it a lot in in different scenes and things and uh you know we couldn't have done it on the real streets because of all the problems with the the drains and everything and and we absolutely had to have it in a controlled environment and there was no other option it was really you know uh one of those fates of right time right place that uh, that made this movie possible Todd is uh, so clever at uh, the little one-liners again another one for Elias Cortez here and uh, he uh, he came from television he uh, as a writer had uh, done the Wonder Years and uh, so he was used to really kind of hitting uh, a uh, you know the right moment um, and more right comic timing and and c continuous pace from television and I think that really helped us with our with our scenes and the uh, the shape of the scenes. We spent three months at the Mondrian Hotel in L.A. really kind of fine tuning the uh, the script and I think it came down one time I, I actually was sitting by the pool for a moment and uh, he came down and he acted out this final confrontation and said look I think this is it and it was like he was the shredder and he was um, splinter and he was the turtles and uh, he acted it all out and it's one of those moments where you look across the other side of the swimming pool and there's all these LA types and they're all looking at him like what the hell is going on there but uh, what was going on there is now going on here on the screen and uh, he uh, he certainly was a, a, a major part of it. I saw the film at Tribeca recently, and uh, the uh, it was at a, a big outdoor festival, and it was a 20th anniversary of the movie, and uh, uh, it was wonderful to see. There was about 2,000 people there, and New Yorkers, and big fans of Turtles, and they were just cheering every line and every character, and. Um, they knew it. They knew it word by word, and and it just uh, I, I, it really struck me. I hadn't really seen that over these, you know, the ensuing decades. I hadn't really seen how it had uh, stayed with people, and uh, it, was, it was very warming to see that. Here's our final moment with the, the shredder that final confrontation that was a tricky shot that high shot and obviously we needed to do a big stunt here dropped into the uh, as I'm sure you've all seen on makings of masses of boxes cardboard boxes I think that was a one taker I suppose if I was uh, to do the turtles again today, the approach would be a, li a little bit different. I mean, they're, the uh, I, I mean, I love that they are there on the set and they're there and they're hugging their their master there and that they they you know they are they are really with us and they're lit by the same real lighting instead of the CG thing. I'm I'm I find it uh, a little hard to. Uh, to relate and engage in, in CG characters generally. I mean, I think Gollum in Lord of the Rings is probably an exception, but uh, I think probably what I, I would do is, uh, is, is use a combination, is maybe the turtle suits that, that really do touch the ground, really do touch and feel and move around, and then possibly add the faces and the, the eyes and the mouth and, uh, and allow that to, uh, to be the things that uh, we add in post and, and, and use modern technology to uh, to push it up a level. 
I think movies like Where the Wild Things Are are kind of heading that way, where they're going back to the Henson spirit and Henson warmth and uh, um, and characterization, and then just using the CGI to uh, to just take you back to more believable. Pretty soon after the film came out, three months later, I got called into Steven Spielberg's office, and I'd never met him, and you know, never gone near him, and uh, and had a really nice meeting with him. He actually asked me to do a film, which I probably stupidly uh, turned down, which was Casper the the ghost story, and um, but uh, he he said that him and his his boy, I can't remember how old he was, maybe ten at the time, had watched Ninja Turtles three times. And he loved it, and he thought it was so different and, and special. And uh, you know, he wanted to uh, wanted to work with me, and I really, obviously, wanted to work with him. And I think I was probably at the stage where I wasn't quite. I wanted to, yeah. Which I, you you are as a director, you kind of want to move on. You don't want to repeat yourself. So I didn't, we didn't quite find the project, but that was a that, that was a sort of impact a film like this can you know have on your career, especially when it. It makes so much money at the box office. Oh, Casey, hi. It was, uh, it, it, uh, it really did very well all around the world, I think. Uh, Germany to France, uh, I remember being carried along by the four turtles uh, at, the Champs, at the Champs Elysees uh, on the front cover of some French. Newspaper and uh, it really changed and and pushed you know me onto on, onto another level. It's quite shocking actually. I think in a way you when when something like that come is is so big. I'm watching now and remembering being on the set of this as we were making it and we were making a movie and we you know we didn't know we were making something that would I would be sitting 20 years later talking about or doing a commentary for or that people would still be revisiting and uh, that would be being made as more sequels and and being bought in the shops and stores still it was nothing like that it was so far removed from that as we were doing it but it was uh, you know it's uh, it's it just I suppose uh, things the stars have to align things have to connect and everything has to come together and, uh, and with this it certainly seemed to Better act this is it. Great Scott! 